The vital importance of air power became apparent soon after the war's beginning. In those first years, the major defensive struggle was directed against the Nazi air attack. As the aerial threat to the British Isles continued, the attention of the world was centered on the skies over England. In 1940 and 1941, the Royal Air Force battled savagely against heavy odds to ward off the Nazis' pulverizing air attacks on England. In the epic battle for Britain, everyone in England turned to and worked ceaselessly in the struggle against the powerful Nazi air offensive. Month after month, England gallantly fought for her life. The Luftwaffe hammered England without let-up. The RAF fought back with every plane at its command. England's unparalleled effort in the battle for Britain was all that prevented the Nazis from winning a quick, overwhelming victory in World War II. After the United States became actively allied with Great Britain, the English scene took on a new complexion. In preparation for the arrival of sizable American Air Force units, construction was rushed on airfields, housing facilities, and hangars. In the early months of 1942, it became apparent that the U.S. would have to transform part of England into a giant base for its planned air offensive against the Nazis. By mid-1942, the facilities were ready for the building up of the U.S. Air Force in England. British officials viewed the growing strength of the American air arm with mounting enthusiasm, well aware of the powerful weapon that would soon implement the Allied attack. Beginning on July 1, 1942, American aircraft for the new U.S. 8th Air Force began arriving in England. During that first month, more than 400 planes were turned over to the 8th Air Force. But the flow of planes to England did not continue at the expected rate during the rest of the summer and autumn. Shipments to England were reduced considerably since a certain amount of new planes had to be sent to fighting fronts in other parts of the globe. But by the end of 1942, the U.S. air arm in Europe, which from humble beginnings was to grow in the next two and a half years to a force of more than 13,000 planes, was gradually assuming the proportions necessary for the all-out air war on the Nazis. Harassing the Nazis from the south were the U.S. Air Force units in the Mediterranean. The importance of Mediterranean bases for furthering our bombing campaign against central Germany was always a factor in the development of plans. On August 1st, 1943, a special bombing effort was carried out from an African base against the Ploesti oil fields, the most important single source of natural oil available to the Axis. The attack was conducted at treetop height, and every crew was briefed to bomb a particular facility in the great installation. mission was carried out with great gallantry, but American losses were heavy. One third of the planes and their crews did not return. As usual, mathematical calculations could not win over unexpected conditions, but the effort was reasonably successful. The effectiveness of the raid was later estimated at 42 and one half percent of production wiped out.
One of the two major functions of the Allied Air Forces in the European theater was its use as a tactical weapon. The air can be employed in a variety of ways to forward the progress of the land battle. One of these was to attack the enemy supply lines. Destruction of bridges, culverts, railways, roads, and canals by the air tends to isolate the force under attack. In several crises of the European campaign, the air flew more than 10,000 combat sorties per day as its share of the ground air battle. Another major function of the Allied Air Forces was its strategic use. We were most anxious to affect the destruction of German industry. The effect upon the land battle would be most profound, and the eventual winning of the war would be correspondingly hastened. Pause answering, pause answering. Yesterday, taxi out and take off. They taxi out and take off. Air up. British strategic bombing operations were usually begun at dusk. Their experience had driven them to bomb only at night. Otherwise, they suffered unsupportable losses. We believed that this was due to the fact that British bombers were designed for range and weightlifting at the expense of speed and defensive firepower. As a rule, British bombers flew without fighter support. Beginning soon after its victory in the Battle of Britain, the RAF launched its all-out offensive against the heart of the enemy's homeland. These attacks grew in intensity. But as the war progressed, the Germans' defense against the British night raids grew more effective. American Air Force preferred daylight precision bombing for best results. In our mounting offensive against the Nazis' European fortress, Allied commanders plotted both night and day air attacks. What's the weather prospect today, Major? Looks like most of Germany will be pretty good, sir. But we have a warm front approaching from down here, which we do not expect to affect the bases until late in the evening. How's the weather at Anklam? At Anklam, sir, we expect two to five tenths of low cloud and small amounts of midland height, not above 18,000 feet. Visibility six to eight miles. Give me the map of Anklam and the picture of the aircraft back there. Yes. American bases in England were centers of constant activity. The daytime raids against targets deep in Germany required quick but thorough servicing of planes the night before. 
in addition to the loading of the all-important bombs that would soon be dropping into German war plans. Okay, fellas, roll out. We have a mission this morning. Next in half an hour. Captain Kirk, Captain Clemson, Lieutenant Pusha, Ackerson, Holloway, and Hawker scheduled a five. Stop it up. <laughs> Before each mission, the crews participating were given a final, thorough briefing on every relevant detail of the operation. Though these raids over Germany soon became an accustomed part of the airmen's routine, each mission presented new special problems, and each briefing held the flyer's complete attention. The target for the day is Anchor. Specifically, you have to destroy the Arado factory. This plant manufactures aircraft components, principally wing and tail assemblies for the Park Wolf 190. Parts are then shipped to New Brandenburg. The Anklam raid was typical, in general, of an important American operation over Germany. The takeoff from 8th Air Force Fields in England was scheduled for the early morning of October 9th, 1943. Four other combat wings of the same group were hitting Marienburg and Gdynia. Two combat wings were assigned to the Anklam attack. had no fighter support. The first opposition was encountered over Denmark, where German fighters attacked in some form.
Back in England, the ground crews waited for the farmers' return. As the hour for their expected arrival drew near, there was a perceptible tension in the air at the base. were somewhat higher than usual. All six combat wings lost 28 bombers. The two wings that hit Anklam suffered most heavily. For every six planes that came back, one did not return. But the raid itself was considered successful. A major part of the Arado plant was bombed out. First order of business for the airmen immediately after landing at the base was a review of the mission with intelligence officers. What happened at the auto plant? Well, our lead squadron dropped their bombs back in the target area. When we came over, we put ours right on top of theirs. Any fire? Going away, our tail gunner reported smoke going up to about 2,000 feet. They won't be making any FW-190 parts there for a long time. Photographs of the target taken during and after the raid supplied 8th Air Force intelligence officers with data which was to prove invaluable in future raids on similar targets deep in Germany. We shared the conviction that through an overpowering air force, the Germans' defenses could be beaten down or neutralized his communications so badly impaired as to make counter-concentration difficult, and his air force swept from the skies. The growth of American air strength in Europe and the Mediterranean was stupendous. Between our entry into the war and the German surrender, our fighter planes had won superiority over the Luftwaffe, and our bombers had penetrated every defense which the German had raised against them.